and we should be live. So we're, I'm either talking to myself or we are talking amongst ourselves, uh, but we should be live on LinkedIn, coming to your screens in three, two, one. Um, so welcome everybody to this month's uh, edition of the Contact Centre Network, and I'm very excited uh, because not only have we got the uh, the inimitable Jimmy Hosang back, uh, we've got uh, for your inaugural visit, uh, Neris Caulfield. So this is the first time uh, we've had you on the um, the show, uh, Neris. Um, so welcome to the Contact Centre Network. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yes, it's great to be part of the show. Absolutely. And Jimmy, welcome back. Yeah, great to be back. Great yeah, to be back. You must have like a, the memory of a goldfish because every time I, I'm, I fear that I will, I will never get another invite and then you keep making the same mistake again. So, All right. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I, I, am a, I am a glutton for punishment, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think you'll provide a, a good perspective to today's topic, which is all about um, agent assist. Um, and how we can use agent assist and AI tools to empower the contact center agent conversation. And it's um, it's something that keeps coming up in every conversation that I'm having. People talking agent assist, agent assist, we need agent assist, we need agent assist. <laughs> um, so I thought, actually, let's have a discussion about it with some people that know their onions and have seen it, uh, been there, and probably implemented it in a number of different contact centers with lots of different t-shirts. So. We're going to tackle the conversation of what is AI and agent assist uh, today. And if there are any questions from anybody in the audience, so if you are watching, um, one, thank you very much for uh, tuning in again. Um, we do have a, a number of people that join the event. So hopefully we've got a, an army of people tuning in to listen to what we've got to say. Um, but if you are watching, drop us a comment into the comment section onto LinkedIn. Let us know where you are tuning in from. Uh, and if you're taking a break from looking after the kids for the school holidays, then go make yourself a cup of tea, get yourself a, a Bakewell tart and tune in for the next 45 minutes or so because it's going to be a good conversation. But we are having um, a, a meaty conversation today. So we've prepared some questions in advance. But what is always good is getting questions from people who are watching. So if you do have a question today, uh, drop it into the comments and it should as if by magic, appear on my screen and I'll be able to bring it up and we'll fire it to uh, one of the, the panelists. But let's do some introductions before we start. So we'll come to you uh, first, Neris, as a, as a newbie to the Contact Centre Network. So give us an intro into yourself and your experience uh, and then we'll come to yourself, Jimmy. So Neris, say hello. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Neris Caulfield. So I'm a bit of a contact centre obsessive. Um, I was... Uh, in the world of outsourcing for almost 20 years, running lots of different campaigns for Volkswagen, Vodafone, Sky, National Apprenticeship Service, British Gas, loads. And then for the last 10 years, I've been working for myself and I really marry tech and operational challenges. So I spend a lot of time in contact centers um, and then I spend a lot of time with tech vendors understanding how they're best to marry one another up. Brilliant. And you do an awesome job as well. So, yeah, uh, welcome, you. welcome to the uh, to the Contact Center Network. And Jimmy, you are uh, a veteran to the network, so people might know who you are. But for anybody who hasn't met you before, give us an intro and uh, say hello. So yeah, thanks, Gary. So yeah, Jimmy Hosang, I'm the CEO of Mojo CX, uh, formerly the Modular Analytics Company, and uh, we specialize in making every conversation valuable within contact centers. And we do that through a number of different ways. The first of which is conversational guidance and next best action. And then um, if that's kind of next best action for customers, we also then do next best action for coaching. So we take all of the data and, and turn it into coaching actions. And then we've got uh, an underpinning technology, which is around speech transcription, natural language processing and speech analytics. And um, yeah, I've been working in contact centers for, for 12, 12 years, 30, about 40, nearly 14 years now. I've been working in contact centers. I can, I've been saying, I've been working it's been in contact long, you can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've done a range of different roles from kind of pricing real time. I've been on the phones and things like that. Um, and yeah, customer contact, my passion. And uh, I love talking about, I love talking about the, the human behaviors and interplay and also the technology. Wonderful. Um, so I think you're both going to provide some really interesting perspectives then to today's conversation. And 
Uh, we've already got lots of people joining as well. So the furthest that we've got so far is Raymond Tan joining us all the way from Singapore. So thanks very much, Raymond. Lovely to have you here. We've got Nick Sellers joining us from the not so far distant uh, uh, areas of the world you. in Scotland. Um, so please do share where you are, where you're dialing in from. Um, and if you do have a question, drop it into the uh, the comments and we'll bring it up for the panellists. But in advance of that, I've got a question for you guys just to kick us off um, today. And I think we'll start with, with you, Jimmy, and kind of, I suppose, just maybe set the scene a little bit um, around perhaps what are the some of the key problems that the, the modern contact centre agent has to deal with at the moment and, and the pain and... Um, I suppose the the issues that they experience that might be driving the need for tools like agent assist. So, what's the problems that the model agent modern agent is experiencing at the moment, Jimmy? What do you think? Yeah, so I've been thinking about this quite a lot over the last kind of kind of three to six months. Um, obviously, it's part of like my day to day, but I'm like, what what is the challenge that we're trying to solve? And I feel as though like in in kind of operational transformation, just the day-to-day -day, like ops, procurement, things like that, we've started to like layer in a lot of different complexity and, and the regulator, we've, we've layered in a lot of complexity and the complexity has, has increased over time. So when I think back to um, when, we, when I first got into contact centers, um, big, thing, big thing then was the removal of scripts so we started to remove scripts yeah. and then we um because we needed to do active listening we needed to be empathetic at the same time that kind of went hand in hand with uh, regulations around treating customers fairly and like new messaging around like what what should and shouldn't be said and things like that um at the same time there was like then SaaS started to become more and more popular. So there was the migration to new CCAS platforms. There was knowledge management. So then all of a sudden we thought knowledge management was the most important thing. Um, and then there was the proliferation of CRM. So actually we wanted to get off the old kind of MS-DOS mainframe systems and we wanted to get to CRM. And then, and then, and then we've got all of the reporting, so all of the Excel and Excel and Power, and then Power BI comes in. So you've got Excel reports and Power BI Tableau and things like that. And if you think about it, the net impact of that is that nothing's actually got simpler for an agent. Um, I would also say some of the automations that have got in place in the self-serve, like migrating simpler tasks on, online. What we've actually seen is like. Um, a layering on of screens and information and data that a normal a normal agent has to process at any one point in time, and that's you know that's just on on voice for a, for a web chat agent. They might be doing like two or three of those all at the same time, and so how, how, how we speak to we speak to our customers about cognitive overload and reducing cognitive overload for customers to put them into the right. Uh, place to make decisions, to make buying decisions, to deal with their requests in the most efficient manner and things like that. But when we started to think about cognitive overload, we started to think, actually, this is exactly what we're placing on the agent. We've completely overloaded the agent with so many things that they have to yeah. think about. And oh, by the way, we've now got vulner customer vulnerability and vulnerability indicators. <laughs> we're not doing through technology. The agent has to actively listen and do that whilst maintaining the quality, whilst um, sell, whilst still selling things. Whilst and smiling. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, and, yeah, and all of these types of things. And so what we've done is we've placed a lot of cognitive overload onto the agent. We've placed a lot of cognitive overload onto customers with like regulations and things like that. And actually even moving, moving up from that, from, from a management perspective, a lot of cognitive overload just, just around. So I think the goal of agent assist notionally is to reduce the cognitive overload and to, or to at least start a path to reduce that cognitive overload. Yeah. And, and I think you made some really interesting points there. And I, I totally agree. I mean, when I go into contact centers, the, the multiple screens start appearing. And when you get beyond two to three screens, it's like something out the matrix. Um, so, Neris, having kind of listened to, I suppose, uh, what Jimmy said there and the, the cognitive overload of customers and the cognitive overload of agents, do you, do you agree? Is, is that what you're seeing in your conversations in the contact centre? Yeah, definitely. I've sort of, I've had a great, great year, I suppose. I've worked with 10 contact centre customers across 
the UK. And so I've sat with about 30 advisors for a long time. I've laughed with them. Last week I cried with them. Um, that was embarrassing. But um, <clears throat> I suppose to, to Jimmy's point, you know, in the late 90s, we were all about scripts. And that script gave a cradle for the advisor to support them through. The unintentional consequences was yep. this, well, you sound robotic, etc. So then it went to prompts. But now my my problem is in the whole scheme of things is agent assist versus co-pilot versus IVAs versus, you know, this amorphous term that nets out at the same impact. So it's like saying fitness assist. It's like, well, there's loads of different applications of the way that you could approach fitness and it would come at different um, parts of the journey. So I guess <clears throat> I, I see a lot of need for it, 100%, but I do think there's a really a real need to stop this amorphous agent assist because it means different mm. things to different vendors. It's like omnichannel, right? It's like yeah. people have lost them. What does that mean? Do we, do you deliver it? Well, I deliver it in my way. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah. you know, so, so there needs to be that real clarity about it. So in terms of, you know, it's like, am I giving the right answers? Real-time knowledge, real-time knowledge support, bring it, doing that translation of the voice and then securing and providing the advisor with the right assets, real-time knowledge support, Am I saying the right things? So the verbatim statements, Jimmy talked about oh, other things like vulnerability triggers, and then there's mm -hmm. all sort of the regulation and the verbatims required. So am I saying my verbatim statements that I'm going to take me down in my quality scorecards? Am I saying them right? So real-time quality support. Am I saying the right thing for the next for the business and for the customer experience? So next best action. Um, so you've sold them this, they might need to be sold this, or they're asking for this, don't forget to tell them about that. And then that then rounding out of, and how do I then summarize what's been said? So my after call work is not so onerous and there's this commonality between that approach. But that is all, all of those things, which are real different functionality of applications for supporting the advisor, assisting the advisor, can be delivered in lots of different ways. And then yeah. there's real-time interaction guidance as well, or I call it real-time interference guidance. Don't tell me I'm speaking too fast. Don't tell me to slow down. I will walk out of this contact yeah. center. That is classic. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That is nonsense but there we go and, and in you my know opinion <laughs> i mean you you've talked about some of the the things that we we alluded to is the the four to five pillars in it in a in a, in a bit of a build-up yeah uh, as part of this and, and i think we we talked about that fifth one being maybe a little bit controversial do you want to do you want to share what that fifth pillar was that you think do we go down that route do we not go down that route and see what people think <laughs> Well, it is, it, I mean, it is slightly contentious, I suppose. So uh, over and above real-time interaction guidance, which um, slow down, speed up, is the real-time sort of, well, you, you also have real-time translation. Yeah. So that's a component part of this. So if you've got advisors in who are got a native language, um, real-time digital translations can present it in their native language and then present yeah. it back. That's super cool. Um, but then you've got real-time accent neutralization. So yeah. if I'm speaking to over the phone to my mates in Scotland or down in Plymouth or in North Wales, sometimes the conversation takes a little bit of time for us both to attune to our respective accents. Yeah. And that's fine when you're a friend and you're invested. It's not so fine when it's transactional. And that time is creating a bit of interference with rapport building etc so accent normalization yeah. is something that we're seeing as well and we've actually switched that on for this webinar so people can understand jimmy <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i'm still not sure if they can, they can understand <laughs> so jimmy i i want to come to you on this because i think um neris has made some really interesting points around all the different use cases uh, that we've got for agent assist and all the different ways um, that it can be, I suppose, orchestrated within the contact center. But how do you think contact center leaders, with all that in mind, 
decide what to buy and how to deploy it in their existing and and or surrounding ecosystems how do you actually start to make those decisions on what to buy and what not to buy i think i think the 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 um so for, uh, i think they're really struggling and i think they're really struggling because um from a from from a landscape point of view um what we need to I try and orientate myself around like where where are we as an industry, and what's happened is, as an industry, we've um, we've layered on all of these SaaS products and da uh, data transformation programs and things like that. So you know you've got people who've like procured a C a new CCAS platform, and the the two years into a five year deal on their CCAS, mm -hmm. and then. Um, but then, then that might be, they might have got the voice through that, then they might have the, the, the web chat through something else. Then they <laughs> procure a knowledge management platform, um, which is like maybe a software as a service kind of content management. Then they've got a learning management platform. Then they've got a CRM that's maybe two years into a, a five-year stint. And what's what's happening is, um, and what, what I'm hearing is, a lot of people who are um, either the economic buyers or the sponsors or even procurement are struggling to get their minds across it. Um, even in, in single brands where we've got single call center on single platform, they feel as though they've been pulled in every single different direction by lots of different SaaS products saying we can put it in here. So you've got your CCAS vendor who's going, we can, we can do all the agent assisting CCAS and we want to own it. That's because, and I'll come on to that in a second. Then you've got your CRM provider. They're going, we could do all of your agent assist and we can put it in there. You're then talking to your knowledge management team and they can do like, I don't know, knowledge prompts or things like that or, and, and stuff. And they want to do a bit in there. And then you've got a whole other team, which is your data, and your data engineering team over here with your data scientists and your AI prompt engineers and stuff who are starting to do stuff, some stuff over there. And what I'm seeing is a lot of, again, cognitive overload in the buying process, which is yeah. um, like I'm getting hit by every direction. And ultimately, like we've, you've got to understand what, what the reason is for that. And the reason for it is that it's protectionism. Everybody's trying to protect their, their space and everyone's trying to get you to become stickier with their particular product and move away from X, Y, and Z. And, and that's because just, just as an industry, like the SaaS product market has peaked and it's going to start to dip off now because of AI mm. and the AI assistance. And therefore it's going to, it's just a super competitive landscape for, for everybody. And mm. agent assist as a, an umbrella term, as, as Neri said, because it's not just agent assist, it's all different bits. It's all bit is is effectively the way in which you can get somebody sticking yeah. or, or, or how you could, how you could lose it as well. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I've, ju I've just popped this comment on here from, um, Inyak Khan, who says the agent utopia world of the unified desktop is still working progress, I guess, for many contact center operations. And I, and I think what you've just spoke about there, Jimmy, is, 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 is very true. People are getting confused. They're getting overloaded by what to buy, where to invest. And I, and I think, I suppose this comes to, to you, Neris, is to say as somebody who specializes in the, the technology procurement process and support in the, 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 the operation to make those purchasing decisions around technology. All of the stuff that Jimmy said around those competing sectors trying to get space in the agent assist um, slice, if you like, how do you help guide operational leaders to, to help them make their decisions around where is best to kind of house it, if you like? Yeah, and, and I think that Jimmy makes loads of good points there. And I think there is a real strong argument to rationalize as much as possible. So to have core applications that deliver as much as possible with recognition that some of the full suite solutions will mean that you are compromising. So what? So so adding a best of breed is the right thing to do. But all of all of it comes back to and Inya is sort of um, it's like, what is the right thing to do for the advisor? It shouldn't be that hard because the stakeholders that Jimmy just talked about, the economic buyer, the CTOs, the CIOs, um, they generally aren't as close as they need to be to the end user community and to the understanding of this 
customer ambitions. So it re the bit that I start with always is, what is your pain? Let's articulate and understand that pain that you've yeah. built up of years of tech debt application, complexity on the desktop. And how does that pain impact the advisor experience? And how does it impact the customer experience? And let's just really clearly define your goals and then let's work back from there. So it is complicated because there is this sort of emergence of um, the, the core vendors trying to steal one another's lunch and trying to have as much of the pie as possible. So it's kind of like, let's just step away from that first and foremost mm -hmm. and be really clear on what it is we want yeah. to ex the uh, agent and the customer to experience. Yeah. Can, I just, and, can, and I, can I just have one thing really quick? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just because, it, it's super, because it's super complica complicated, but um, it's... If a, if a decision's been made two years ago to go for, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not picking on Verant, but like, I'll just pick on Verant. If a, if a decision's been made a couple of years ago that, right, we're going to go for Verant for speech analytics, that that decision almost becomes like part of an issue like yeah. not today, because we want to move to the agent assist. Well, agent assist, you need real-time audio streaming, real-time transcription. So as part of the package that you bought two years ago, you may you might go, actually, Verant doesn't do it in real time in this particular bit that we want now. Mm. But procurement go, we've already bought speech analytics, we've already we're already paying for transcription. Yeah. yeah. So there is it's elements part of our package, of, yeah. yeah. So these elements of um to in order to move forward with a particular solution, there are elements of cost layering that you're going, yeah. going to have to do because you might go, well, we already do knowledge management over here. Yes, but it's a different it's a different way yeah. of looking at the problem, it's a different kind yeah. of it's a different issue. And so I see a lot of companies and procurement wrestling with this. Wait, well, we we thought we had X, Y, and Z, but it doesn't actually all pull together mm -hmm. into agent assist. And, and I think you you make a really valid point. And and Inyat's made a, a good comment in the uh, in the chat around uh, roadmaps. And I, and I think it goes back to what you were saying, uh, Neris, is to say understanding what the goals are and and it's not that one year goal it's not that two year goal it's saying right what do we want to be doing over the next three to five years and what tech infrastructure do we need that's going to help us meet those um demands so when you're looking at things like speech you're actually saying right speech plus agent assist plus any other kind of guidance that's where that's the state that we want to get to that's the customer experience that we want to deliver um and, and i think that's a, a really key point is to say right having a clear roadmap of what technology you've got and what technology then can support that and complement that in different ways is is um is a, is is a key part of any uh, i suppose vendor selection process um and I, and i've just added on just as as a comment from some of the the stuff that you were talking around there neris around how do you engage and how do you understand what the pain points are and what the use cases are just the comment from nick here about bringing those stakeholders into the mix and bringing those frontline <laughs> users um, into the mix to kind of get their input into some of the, the problems and issues that they're trying to solve. Um, so I think Nick's points are a really valuable one about bringing in people who are at the coalface. Yeah, so so I guess can, I'll pick up on, on that one from Nick. So so I'm going to, I was with uh, judging um, best contact centre culture at the moment for the CCMAs and this notion of stealing with pride where they all work network with one another. And I love that notion. So I'm going to steal with pride um, a term that I heard from. So I'm working with one com at the moment and one of their customers is Dr. Care Anywhere. And Dr. Care Anywhere have this beautiful phrase, which is nothing about us without us. And it's so simple, but it resonates so hard because so often I get told, well, no, 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 we're not in including the advisors. And I fight hard to have them yeah. very much part of, of course, all, all the discoveries of, of, are around frontline and bringing that back into the business and, and translating that back, but including them in part of that decision-making process mm -hmm. and ensuring that they're seeing, well, that's going to be interesting on my desktop and, oh yeah, but I need to be able to search because so I can't tell you the amount of times that they have been out of the loop and then you bring them into the loop and suddenly the lens is very different. At the wrong well, time, well. yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Just for UAT, it's like, no, 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 no. They definitely need to be part of that process. 
be, to inform the process and ideally to be part of the buying team. And now mm. people will be like, oh, no, we're not doing that. But that's but that more for them. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's part of that change advocacy, isn't it, as well? Bringing them in to kind of say, right, yeah. actually, if we introduced X into the process, how much would it benefit you? How much would it benefit the customer? And any knock on impacts in terms of the, the overarching process. So totally, I, yeah. I, I 100% agree. Hundred percent agree. Um, I think we've touched on a lot around how technology or agent assist technology integrates with other systems. Um, and and I think we've we've obviously mentioned that there are there are a number of different systems that it can integrate with. But I think what I'm interested in and in the perspective of is is ha actually how does it drive shifts in performance? So Neris, I'm going to come to you with this one and and ask where are you seeing. Um, agent assist technology improve, I suppose, key performance metrics in the contact center? And, and where are you seeing those benefits starting to come into the contact center operation? Well, I suppose real-time knowledge support is, is really um, important because all too often the, you know, knowledge is in SharePoint folders that are quite difficult to access. They don't allow for fuzzy matching search and all those types of things. So, so the bit where you're sitting with an advisor and a customer asks a difficult question that they don't know the answer to, or worse, they've taken the time to find the resource and then they're very sure that that isn't what it says on the website or what they heard yeah. on their morning huddle in um, briefing. And so they're being presented with old information. That's the bit that terrifies them and that's the bit that makes them feel really uncomfortable. So going to the world where whisper coaching, you know, that that notion is available to them real time yeah. through knowledge assets being provided and saying, I this is what they're talking about. Here's the stuff about policy, insurance policy. Um, here's the stuff about, you know, the contractual terms. All of that, that is really great. And, and the, the impact it's making is making an impact on competency curve. It's making an impact yeah. on AHT. It's making an impact on... Um, <clears throat> advisor retentions, you can correlate that, <clears throat> making them feel, you know, <clears throat> confident that they're giving the right answers. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a lovely thing. Yeah. And, and I think <laughs> there's probably some additional points that you could build on that with Jimmy in terms of where you're seeing in terms of some of the, the stuff that you do around agent assist. How is that kind of changing the the shape of the, the conversation, the, the the return that we're seeing on um, agent development and um, overarching conversations. Where are you seeing performance metrics uh, start to improve by use of agent assist? So, so yeah, just going back to what we're saying about cognitive overload. For me personally, I'm absolutely terrible at just like bombarding people with loads of different information. And yeah, so we've been going like, how do we actually simplify? Like, what what is the the minimum viable feature, what are we trying to do and how are we trying to remove overheads? So I would I would say there's a few different things. So first of all, real-time transcription with auto summarization, auto note taking. That's just a win for everybody. So it's a win for the it's a win for the agent. They don't have to just go into the go into the CRM and update the notes straight away. Um, it's a win um, it's a win for uh, ops because they reduce handling time. We're seeing HT reductions of five to ten percent across the piece by not having to do note taking. It's an improvement for compliance. Um, we've got all of the uh, consumer duty regulations around notes and things like that coming in. Like to be perfectly honest, the standard and quality of note taking yeah. across every single industry across every single business and i'm not i'm not um i'm not leaving myself out of it because i have to take notes and i'm absolutely terrible it's really really poor so the quality of the note taking is much higher so you typically we're saving 10 percent of aht across the piece the agents um we you, can utilize that time to have some off the phone rest so if we if we start to notice that an agent is maybe being rest. Give that, that's not what the WFM team is saying, but yeah, that's <laughs> the, that's the <laughs> ideal scenario. That's the real, the, that real... is the unintentional consequence of it. <laughs> As a, as they a, go, oh, well, they can just answer the next call straight away. Yeah. As a former real time, I'm, I've said that we build in a little bit of uh, rough yes, time. For real time anyway. So yeah. not to bother. But then, yeah, so, um, and then from a quality point of view, that's that's improved. And then I think the next layer up from that is around um, 
auto um, auto QA. So just around removing removing kind of management overheads and, and getting across more more calls. So we're saving between like fifty to seventy five percent of operational costs uh, for QA by doing auto QA and getting across a hundred percent from the piece. Mm. Um, and and that's and that's typical across every platform that you could that you use. Um, and and a real and and then finally just a really important one I think is um auto vulnerability detection so um the reality is we um every single um kind of fs regulated company at the minute is pushing the responsibility to detect vulnerability down to agents and i don't i don't feel that that is correct at all i think it's correct notionally where they're the person having the first uh, the first kind first of line of defense if you like first line of defense. but the responsibility of it like and the responsibility to you know hit your regulatory and your compliance goals i just think that that's a lot of pressure when there's all these other things yeah. that are spinning at the same time so i think the real-time vulnerability detection is a, is a key element of support and a um we talk about like full automation and ivas is like a self-driving car well just having the cruise control and just having the support and the guide rails of going we think that this is vulnerable do you think do you think it's the case is just a vital bit of support to take away all of that responsibility off the frontline agent mm-hmm. I, you know you make some really valid points there especially around the the compliance elements of um of, of the contact center i mean I, I've worked in the, the frontline operation, I've done management leadership, I've been in the QA side of things, and the, the biggest stress that you get from agents is, am I doing this right? Am I saying the right things? Am I giving the right information? And that causes so much stress and anxiety, especially when you're working in a sales-related role where one wrong move can cost you X amount, £100 of your bonus. So that the stress that um, the agents are under is is significant. So if we can use those tools to help alleviate some of those stresses. And I think the ability to to canvas more calls in a QA fashion and give more feedback um, yeah, and give amazing. more coaching development is, is game changing in terms yeah, of that ability yeah. to improve speed to competence, ability to improve overall confidence in, in general and reduce the risks that, um, that, that customers are facing. And I think, um, Neris, I'm, I'm gonna come to you for this one because I think Jimmy's made a, a really interesting point about um, customer vulnerability and some of the, the the issues and the impact that contact centers are facing when it comes to logging and, and underlogging that. And is, is that something that you're seeing with, with your client base and, and how are contact center leaders navigating that using agent assist tools? Yeah, and I think it's not entirely bi- like binary that are they, aren't they? And I think it's quite circumstantial. So, and I think the risk appetite of individual organizations will include a much broader range of what they determine as vulnerability and that flag, that level of flag um, that's put on it. So, I mean, FinServe, they are going through an awful lot um, in that that world. And I think that um, vulnerability support and just because sometimes they miss it, sometimes they're deep into answering the questions that they miss the indicators that dem- that show vulnerability. Sometimes it's front and center. But sometimes it absolutely isn't. And it's not just the FinServe regulate, you know, those guys. It's the utilities companies as well have to do an awful lot around vulnerability. So, yeah, that is a, that is a really um, good use case. And, and I think the other the other aspect of that, and this is certainly when I was in the, <laughs> the FinServe sector, it was the it was the ability to recognize a complaint. And actually, yeah. you, you, you were just as in as much trouble for underlogging as you were for overlogging complaints. So having tools mm-hmm. that take that, I suppose that challenge away from the agent and to, to your point Jimmy create that cognitive overload of having to spin lots of different plates um, I think that's an important aspect that agent assist can support with do you think yeah and it's in the QA side, so it's in the auto QA side when you're flagging negative sentiment indicators and things that you know will end up net out into a complaint yeah. and then it's also in that real-time sort of sentiment understanding as well so yeah. to allow the advisor to clock to feel like oh yeah this is something that could escalate into a complaint because again there's a real drive to yeah. less than x in a thousand yeah. complaints so yeah we um yeah 
it's um just the simplification of it is like complaint is a complaint's an interesting one. So complaint to me is a lag indicator because of things that have gone on before. And therefore, like with some of the prompts to keep it to the minimal, minimum amount of prompts, what we tend to see is that the biggest cause for complaint is um first of all uh, lack of call control so an agent saying uh hi you threw to jimmy ho sang at mojo cx uh how can i help you today that just allows maybe a, an already irate customer to just like launch at them and you've kind of lost control of the call and so an easy prompt is this is your call opening you you threw to jimmy ho sang i'm a specialist uh, sales advisor at mojo cx can i start by taking your postcode or your date of birth or your your policy id it starts to get you into a, the right rhythm of the call so even simpler what we've is if you just get your call opening correctly it, everything else follows and then the final bit is um confusion so how confusion leads to complaints the confusion leads to escalations that leads to complaints and so how can you do confusion indicators so um the lead indicator for a complaint flag would be um i don't understand or can you repeat that again or I'm really not getting this. Like, why? Do, like, why do I have to do this again? It's things like that that lead to the escalation, which leads to the complaint. And so, prompts around like these these elements of confusion, slow down, or repeat back what you've said. Things like that, I think, are really, really important. And it's just almost as simple as those two things, like um, call control and reducing confusion. Yeah. You see ridiculously good results just yeah. without all of the other stuff. And, and, you know, I think you, you've touched on a really valid point there is say, what is too much? So, I mean, Neris, you said right at the at the start is we've got all of these four, five, six different things that can be considered to be to be agent assist. And I think the, the danger is sometimes is we try and implement them, implement them all uh, and we do it really badly. So mm. if, if you were going to give from from your point of view, Neris, if you were going to give contact centers some advice around which ones would be the the, the, the most impactful ones to implement in your contact center you you've said a, a couple jimmy but neris from your perspective which ones do you think are the ones that actually can add real value yeah so i, I think real-time knowledge support as i said i was thinking about this analogy the other day i was chatting to um a taxi driver who'd come from london and was in gloucester and um he we were talking about the knowledge and i was like i cannot believe the knowledge still exists it takes four years to do the knowledge for a black cab driver it costs 800 pounds and you can only ever take it twice. I would take that 90 times and I would never pass the knowledge. <laughs> but why do you need the knowledge when there's ways and yeah. sat maps available? It's like a really weird notion. And that's the, that's the analogy that I think is really strong for the advisors. Yes, they need to go into the classroom training. But like Jimmy said, that's sometimes in Finso, that is six weeks of combine you know training before they're even in the grad bay that is a lot of intel information and then it's changing all the time um so i think that real-time knowledge support yeah. is is really good yes the auto qa in the background for the quality management and the improved customer experience and the where are my cohort advisors that aren't getting this bit right aren't getting that bit right that's that side of things and and I do agree. So that's so for the advisor on their desktop, real time knowledge support, and yeah, auto summarization at the end, and that helps the advisor as long as you are giving them that breathing space and ACW time. Because the interesting thing that is happening, and it like I can touch type, and I love the fact that I can touch type. Advisors aren't very good at typing. You know, and so their their ACW is a lot to do with the fact they're like, this is how I type. Can I not type on my yeah, phone? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, actually, we'll take that away from you, and we'll create a consistency, and you can stop this notion of this um, huddle here, this team here. They all use this language, and they'll use this shorthand in this, or yeah. to, you know, their after call work. Um, so that is a really great tool as well. Yeah. But yeah, front front and center knowledge guidance yeah. behind that quality support around verbatim. So yeah. have I said the right thing? And, and I don't think there's any right or wrong to to any of these. But I think no. the, the the point that um that Nick said on, on that point of auto summarization is um 
and, and you said it earlier, Jimmy, is who reviews the AI generated summary <coughs> before posting it to the record? Um, clearly, maybe the agents don't necessarily have time. So I think we, we've talked about the consistency of notes. We've talked about the um, the standardization of, of those notes as well. But actually, who's who's assessing those for accuracy, Jimmy? It's a good point. So it's quite interesting. I think um, where we've where we've done summarization um, before we start, we um, we bring in historic notes. We we'll bring in historic um, historic uh, audio. We'll do some prep work, historic historic uh, like analysis, and then we'll bring in the notes from the CRM that corresponded with it. And I think that element, and then we'll also we'll we'll then run summarization against it and compare the notes. I think that kind of anchoring about what the nature of the problem is um is really important to, to just to begin with because if you go i've got an ai it's going to do all of your summarizations the very first thing that people say is well how accurate is it and it needs to be 90 percent accurate like it can't go straight in yeah. We anchor it back to what are you doing already and what you find is what you're doing already is there's a load of people who put star 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 in it there's a load of people there's a load of people who don't really put a, a lot in na it. <laughs> na there's a load of people who write war and peace and, it, and the next person who goes into the record <laughs> has to like read read loads and loads of stuff to get to the point so that the anchoring bit's important however to nick's point um ev almost every single one of our clients with our real-time uh, auto summarization is in beta so we just rolled it out across a few different clients uh, at the moment small so it's smaller scale and we'll ramp it up every single one of our clients does not want us to go straight to the crm to post the record every single one of the, us at the end of the call wants a pop uh, and with the edit button which uh, so the agent can see it and then they can they can amend it and then they post it to the notes uh, post it to the crm and i think that uh, at the moment, we're still in that kind of phase where we don't trust the technology enough to let it go and do it itself. And therefore, the client, our, our clients are more than willing to uh, take a little bit more of a hit on the benefits case and not realize as much benefits, but, but feel as though they're in control. However, mm. I do feel that very quickly over the over the next few years, they will get comfortable enough with the yeah. with the technology that it'll just become de facto. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Definitely. I mean, and you talked about a, a five to ten percent <laughs> saving on AHT there. And when you say five to ten percent, it doesn't sound material, but when you actually play that through a capacity plan, a five to ten percent saving on your AHT can be a significant volume of resource. Yeah, well, ACW is always supposed to be about ten percent of a of average talk time, right? So that's where you that's where the savings are coming, and it's really interesting that point that Nick's made and the the answer how Jimmy's you know experience of working with customers on it because it is about a confidence curve because mm. if you've spent any time looking at advisor notes and seeing the the transactional history pop in the CRM and going. What? What are they on about? What happened? <laughs> you know, you do know that it is going to be better. But I think going forward, there's an in interaction analytics that will include that summarization because that, because there's going to be a deep consistency of that summary of what's happened in the call, that's going to be your go to place for determining where's my failure demand coming from. Where's my opportunity to that. improve the customer service? Yeah. So it's it's yeah. in that data yeah. that you're going to understand more. You know, yeah. when, when totally dispositions, they're yeah. going to be gone in a couple of years. And it's that summarization. Yeah. That and and you know, we, we've not even looked at the use case of, of what does this whole thing mean for <laughs> process improvement and lean methodologies and, and making those kind of iterations to, to kind of different types of demand and, and and eliminating some of that demand so i think there's a whole different use case outside of agent assist that, that can support that that we can use it for but i think it's um it's it's an interesting point that we make around how the agent intervenes and how that human kind of confidence rating um still kind of needs to be warmed up a little bit and i think it leads yeah. me to um, I suppose the, the, the penultimate question here which is really how do we see the role of human agents evolving 
as agent assist technologies become more advanced. So I'm going to start with you on that one, Jimmy, and then Neris, I, I'll ask you to um, add, add a few builds on. So how is the, the role of the human going to change as agent assist technologies become more advanced, Jimmy? What do you think? Yeah, and, and I think that leads to kind of, yeah, my, my self-driving car analogy a little bit, where I think we're actually, um, and goes right back to the beginning about how do people procure things, we're actually, because we're, we're not sure of the technology, we're, we're actually being asked to deploy things, which takes more time and takes more energy and is more complicated from an engineering point of view so it can interact with a human rather than just posting it straight to a database. And so, um, so I think that the first thing is, yeah, um, self-driving car, it's like cruise control. So what are, the, what are the comfort level things that you can do where you've got a human in the seat but you can remove some of the remove, remove some of the extraneous elements uh, around them and so i think first of all um the the knowledge management the important prompts and things like that as we've said um so i won't labor that point um to realize a a, a real-time near-term cost saving of 10 percent it would be taking the notes doing auto summarization of the notes that gives you so much, what would I say, by by doing auto summarization and a bit of QA and a bit of overhead stuff, that benefits case just, just washes its face straight away plus. And that gives you all of the other opportunity to, to add additional prompts and things. Um, but then I think um, the final, final couple of bits is we will start to move away from an agent doing any tasks on the phone because the manual input of tasks, the manual going to knowledge management systems, the manual even like pulling different things, pulling different things from different places and maybe sharing it with the with the customer will just be completely gone. Um, and to that end, the view of unified desktop, it's like what is a desktopless environment? So you don't need it. You, all you need is a single screen, which will which will support you in the conversation. But everything else, all of the AI and the automations, kind of go on behind the scenes. That's what will start to kind of bleed in over the next kind of two to three years, I believe. Interesting, interesting thoughts, uh, Neris. What what would you say from that? Where do you think the the human agent um, role is in agent assist as it evolves? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. If you think about this conversation. And the fact that Jimmy and I and you can all just relax and just think about what the other one's saying and really not have to imagine if you were asking me, oh, oh Neris, why are you doing this? Can you just type a load of stuff and can you also just grab this? That that changes my experience. I'm not going to be able to give you in and, and the audience as much as I would if I'm just relaxed and not being asked to do anything else. So yeah. The, the brilliant thing about generative AI is it doesn't need structured data. So you don't need databases. So we, yeah. I do foresee that world that Jimmy outlines there happening. But the reality is we are going to be left with um, advisors on the voice channel handling customers who need comfort and who are in crisis and where, they're, where the complexity is as such that they need that. Now, all of that means the advisor has to be present with that customer and therefore they have to be supported as effectively as possible to manage those customers in crisis who need comfort and who need you know, navigating through complexity. And so I, that's where I think agent assist is their real time ways, their sort of, yeah, I call it their um, seek, you know, um, imaginary friend, um, that type of thing in the background to really support that shift in that interaction type yeah and, and i suppose when we start to think about it in terms of what <laughs> can it remove that an agent has to do and and how is that going to have a material impact on the the benefits case jimmy where are you seeing the i suppose the the customers coming to you and saying right we want to save do we what is it that we want to save money is it we want to reduce headcount or is it we want to improve the customer experience what what are you seeing as, as kind of the key asks of, of what agent assist can do, or is it a combination of all of that? Yeah, interesting. So it's it's almost it's it's quite complex because there's lots of different pillars mm. um, that we need to, that you need to consider these these efficiency. So how can you save money? I think 
I'll probably say that is the most that's that's the most prevalent one. How can you save me money on call, and how can you save money on overheads? Yeah. And um, and I think that's number one. The second one I would say is quality. So how can you improve my quality whilst I, whilst also recognizing the costs? And I would say risk risk and compliance is kind of risk and compliance is number three with the mm. with the vulnerability. What's been missed across all of this, I find which I find quite interesting, is um is things like CX and not really being mentioned, but predictive NPS or expected NPS. You can predict uh, as a call goes through, you can predict what NPS scores are going to be or what your CSAT scores are going to be. But I'm not seeing it's really mm. interesting. We do some of that type of stuff. Um, I'll give a name check to one of our one of our uh, rivals, a value agent. Um, uh, they've got their XMPS measure, um, which is really really cool. But it's 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 weird how that's been like almost deprioritized against those other three things. And no one no one's talking about upsell, cross sell, value. Um, Next best action, yeah. yeah. So we're, which is like hyper hyper valuable. Um, and we, we we employ it in retention strategies and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, it's not being used. However, what I will say is just for the for the kind of go forward things, where we where we're seeing like some of the future stuff is around. Well, if efficiency is the main thing, well, how can you make things efficient? And you know, we talk about desktopless kind of interactions. There's some really cool things that you can do now around keying. So we've got auto auto keying on our roadmap where a uh, customer is asking for a change of address. The, the agent can listen and, and answer them and collect the information um, in a in a uh, in an active listening manner. But all of the keying, all of the updating of the CRM, all of that type of stuff can be done without the agent touching a keyboard. And again, that saves on error rates, it saves on on yeah. key costs and things like that. So I think it'll be a consistent chipping away of like yeah. the, the efficiency metrics until unfortunately what you end up with is uh is full AI, voice AI who can do it who can do it all for you. Yeah. And and you know what, I think there's 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 some things that we've talked about here around efficiencies and saying actually right, is it an FTE saving that we're trying to make? But I think the reality of it is is that not one single contact center I've been to has an abundance of people and a lack of demand. So for, for me, when you start to kind of say, right, actually, is it there as a cost saving? Is it there as an FTE reduction? Or is it there as a redistribution of the work to allow people to work smarter and, and more effectively? That's for me where I see that the main use case coming from is driving some cost savings through efficiency, not necessarily through a NFTE saving. Are you are you seeing similar stuff there, Neris, from from the conversations yeah. that you're having, or are you saying people are saying actually we need to do a ten percent <laughs> reduction on budget? And it, and because that's I hear that a lot at the same time as well. Yeah, so exactly that, exactly that, and sort of um, drive efficiencies is sort of like a bit of a euphemism for cut cut me some yeah. heads. Um, but but actually, if you reframe that and you say what you don't want to be doing as a business, given the headwinds of commercial situations that most businesses are facing, is wasting money. So let's make sure you're not wasting money. And a lot of them are wasting a lot of money through the inefficiencies. So it's about trying to help understand and articulate that because people normalize those inefficiencies. I say that all the time, but they absolutely do. Because mm -hmm. you watch and you go, Go into that spreadsheet, and now why are you doing that? It's just because yes. conformist bias says that's what I've always <laughs> done, and so now it's normal for me to be this inefficient, and this is costing the business money. So, so it's it's a reframing of that, and the and then, then like Jimmy says, is adding that value layer. How can we it, how can we add value into this interaction so that the advisor is driving a better NPS? Please let's get to a world where the customer isn't being asked to do NPS survey soon. Please, let's get to a world where we just work it out ourselves. Are the customers happy or not? Um, so, and then where's the opportunity to cross sell, upsell, save, all of that side of things. So yeah. it's always rooted in commercials, but it's just how you frame yeah. that. And, and I think, I mean, I see Agent Assist always featuring in customer service yeah. conversations. I don't always hear it. From from your point of view there, Jimmy, saying actually, right, how can we make our sales, how can we improve the conversion of our sales team? How can we improve the average order value of our of our orders? How can mm. we increase the cross-sell upsell? Why do you think that the bias is is more towards customer service? Is it just because of the size of the population, or is there a is there more of a material benefits case 
in customer service seen more readily? It's 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 because it's a misunderstanding of the problem and the 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 feeling that we're just going to cut customer service costs to the minimum, mm. and, and not seeing that customer service is a is a profit center, not just a cost center. Yeah. Like all of the value, all of the value has been left on the table within customer service because if you deal with the customers where Wismo at the minute. But like, where is my order? Comes in, you, you locate the order, and then you can upsell them like another product, especially for fast fashion, or or even if it's um, even if it's kind of a, a high street retailer, it's it might be batteries, additional batteries for a toy. There's all the value being left on the table, but we see customer service as cost, and cost is our enemy, and we're trying to drive out all of the cost, and we're completely removing all of the all of the va- uh, value that we could have. And, and I, think, I think Nick summarised that well below. Do you, would you agree with, with Nick's comment there, Neris? Yeah, demand for value without willingness. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I don't know where it's supposed to come from. But, yeah, exactly. It is a very collective thing. And it needs that end-to-end um, understanding and appreciation and working together between tech, digital, customer service, yeah. you know, ops, and then that back-end analyst team and, yeah, it, it, it is an unwillingness. And, and yeah, yeah, when you're driving failure of demand, you've got to go upstream and work out where it's coming from elsewhere in the business and yeah. get rid of it that way, not just go, Definitely. yeah. I- I agree I, with Nick, yeah. yeah. I actually think I actually think just on just on, just one like 10 seconds on that point. That's what's the problem with contact centers at the moment is the adoption. We talk about agent assist. What about the adoption of agent assist? <laughs> Like if you don't adopt the best principles and drive that change through the business, it makes it very easy to look yeah. like self-serve my account or a voice IVR can do your job better than you. Whereas yeah, actually, 100%. Like, like it can't. Yeah, yeah, it can't. Yeah, it can't. If you don't adopt it, you're not using yeah. best principles and you'll look like a cost center. Yeah. And, you know, the biggest area of um, of gap that I see when I'm working in a contact center is all around that whole knowledge management piece and the fact that the the knowledge base isn't structured, it isn't ordered, it isn't cataloged, it isn't automated, nobody owns it. Um, So it becomes a a, a big struggle to actually start to to support it. And I think Catherine makes a, a really good point here in terms of how agent assist tools can actually improve the overall um, recruitment and, and attrition problems that we see within the, the within the contact center. And I think it's worthwhile um, noting we do see a big drop off in that incubation period, in that model office period, um, and actually providing the right knowledge base, providing the right tools can not only reduce your recruitment costs, it improve your retention rates, and it has a knock on impact in terms of that employee satisfaction. So I think it's worthwhile um, just sharing that comment with Catherine. Final question for the day then, um, before we before we wrap up, is just thinking about what are the future trends that we need to be mindful of, uh, and what do we think is is going to happen in the next two to three years with agent assist tools, Jimmy? If there was a couple of things that you could predict, Jimmy, where what where would you place your predictions for the next two to three years? And then Neris, I'll ask you the same, and then we'll we'll wrap up for the for the for the session. So, what are your predictions, Jimmy? So, I think prediction number one. Web applications are going to reduce in um, in value, and everybody's going to want to be on the desktop. So desktop applications are going to become like de rigueur and and effectively become more and more popular. And that's because you need control of the desktop, of the workflows, of all of the different screens and things like that. And the best way of doing that is via desktop. I think it's very very. Um, we, we've developed a desktop app um, and everybody about six months ago was like, why have you developed a desktop app? It's because of the control that it gives you. And you'll you'll have seen over the last few weeks, OpenAI have uh, released their desktop app and their Satya Nadella was talking about screen capture and screen recording um, and process capture coming as standard as part of the uh, as a new uh, Windows build. That's because of uh, that's because of control and capture. I think I think Microsoft are calling it recall, but effectively it's constant screen recording, constant screen capture uh, in order for, for to control processes and to train AIs. So that's number one. Uh, number two. Um, I think that the next step, once you go past 
summarization and 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 prompts will be auto keying so um it will be um the agent never touching the keyboard or steps towards the agent not touching the keyboard and to be reducing overheads and improving quality and, and efficiency and accuracy through uh, the ai and um, uh, completing those tasks and then you know i said a year ago um, on, I think this podcast, the what the chat GPT was it a year ago? Was it years yeah, ago? My event, um, my around around um, CCast platforms and CRMs, I think we're, we're we're going to be moving to a stage where um, there's going to be a reduction in the amount of CCast licenses. Um, even if you've still got two thousand agents, it'll be two thousand agents that are being intelligent a portion of which are being intelligently rooted by an AI that's just sending you calls and sending you audio and, and be doing your self-serve IVR and pinging it on rather than these CCAS platforms. And I think a reduction of CRM licenses because if you don't yeah. have a human a, a human keying information into it, then why do you need all of that, all of the, the screens and the UIs and the licenses? Mm -hmm. And I think that, and to trigger actions and to trigger emails and to tr trigger letters and things, I think that'll be, um, that'll yeah. be the, the next things and the next way of saving money. That, over that'll be interesting when we talk price elasticity in the CCAS market then, when we see those contractions. <laughs> interesting. Neris, your, your final thoughts and predictions? Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of articles about the, the what's happening with the CCAS players and that, that um, conflict between CRM and CCAS bedfellows to arch enemies, etc. And I think Jimmy's right. There needs to be some rationalisation in that space. But for 26 years, people have been asking me about my predictions and I always get them wrong. But I do <laughs> think my hope, my hope is that the intelligence and insight that AI can provide, give businesses the, um, you know, that the, the, they're now able to see and understand where their opportunities are to drive better value in the customer interactions. And very specifically, that advisors feel better supported to do their jobs and they don't come into work and have, have, have occasions where they their stomach is churning because they mm. don't know how to answer the questions. So okay. that's, and, and I think it, that'll take a long time. That confidence curve um, is going to take a long time to get there. And people will make mistakes under the, uh, along the way. And that will resonate, you know, that will resonate long, more than any of the value stuff that's going mm. on, unfortunately. So that reticence yeah. will be there. But yeah, interesting about the applications on the desktop side of things yeah. as well. I think, yeah, that's I fine. totally understand that trajectory. Brilliant. Well, we've reached the, the top of the hour now, so we are sadly done, but we could talk about this for probably another good hour. Um, mm. But uh, I just all that remains to be said is uh, thank you from me to yourself, Neris, and to you, Jimmy, for, for joining. I thought it was a really useful discussion. Thank you very much to everybody who has contributed in the chat as well. Some really great um, substance in there as well. So please do go back and, and read and comment and, and like and share for any that, uh, that um, float your boat. And this will be available for people to play back. So please do play back. And if you're watching playback, thank you very much for watching. Um, but I'll ask Neris and Jimmy just to stay on for 60 seconds more, but we'll end the stream here. Thank you very much and see you again next month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.